Okay, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone, according to your country. Greetings to all of you who are participating of this international environmental forum, such as Alejandro said, great participation yesterday. So we will begin this um, second round today. Today, we will begin with the panel, which is very interesting. It is called There is No Planet B, Civilization Crisis, Disputes in Transition, and Socialist Ecology, with the participation of Pakistan, Spain, Argentina, and Australia. So we will hear different voices of this, uh, such an amazing, uh, an important topic. So we can begin right now. First speaker will be Renato Flores from SIPCOM. Renato, are you there? Can you start? Perfect. Whenever you want. Give me one moment so I can share my screen, but it won't let me. I need authorization for that. If not, I can just speak, no problem. Oh, you can do it if you just need to give it a minute. Try again. Let's see. Okay, good afternoon. Can you see me and can you hear me? Yes, perfect. As it was said before, my name is Renato. I'm from the group SIPCOM. What we do is um, put into question planification, early planning, and we also try to study econophysic, the different ways of modeling um, economy. So I would like to present our proposal. We are a collective and we try to develop and show that planification methods are possible and can be used for transition to a socialist model. Well, this is who we are. We use translation of texts and also our own production of texts about cyber communism. And we have two main axes about cybernetic planification as our proposal and our critic of the market and also um, econophysics. Okay, so we also study ecology from the um, concept of metabolic factor. It is a concept that was developed by Marx and John Bellamy Foster and Kohei Saito. As Marx said, is that we need to explain that our current crisis, it's part of a historic process. We have come apart from nature, human existence. Marx said, there is an organic existence outside from the human body. Okay, so when capitalism is developed and also during the industrial revolution, have this sensation of work being isolated and using a perspective of value. And then is when the relationship and the link with nature is broken. So human metabolism as a society, it is linked to, to nature through capitalism and it is a way of uh, 
Uh, it is a really damaging way of doing so. And we are seeing that now in the climate disaster, which I think has been covered already. So our idea is uh, this idea of fracture, metabolic fracture, is how that relationship between humans and nature should be in a socialist society. That's why we are studying. And the issue is um, capitalism and the fracture between humans and nature through capitalism, through the value rules, through money. So in order to repair the country, we need to have a conscious government. A government that's conscious of that relationship between humans and nature. And that we have to rethink uh, economy. We cannot keep burning fossil fuels or oil. We know that our methods of production are designed in a way that they harm nature. In order to set that back, we do have to control and replan everything. So for planifications, people who have studied it, we do have two axes. What we propose is uh, to be able to calculate everything. In, in nature, in uh, regarding units, physical units, we need a new way of measuring everything, how we use land, and these measures should be planned, how much energy is consumed, how much energy is produced. And as I said before, one of the first persons who talked about these cases, uh, let's say 100 years ago, if we plan everything according to a calculation of dollar, euro, or any point value, it, there won't be any way to um, be linked with nature in a healthy way. It will be much more complicated. So our second axis is basically that we need a democratic plan we cannot just let just some limited people decide everything. We want to participate with information. One of the things that we propose, uh, we have not talked about that that much, uh, it's referendum. And there are many studies that show that it can be quite beneficial. These are things that we like to study other ways of direct democracy. If we had a plan, how do we uh, make those decisions? Because if we just let some people decide everything, they can ruin that plan, stealing land or with any other damaging practice. So regarding our proposals, with um, Ellen Cottrell and Jean-Philippe Dabridge will pu publish a book about um, the ecologic crisis and economic planification. We have like that, um, we really like that book and we have made a YouTube review about that. And it talks about how, how it works because many times one says, I want to do that, or I want to do another thing, but how do we do that? So that's um, something we are working in, how to actually carry out the planification. So we also have uh, this urbanization debate, urban planification. This debate has decades, let's say 30s, 40s. Um, some of those debates were completely abandoned. Because um, nowadays cities are inefficient, destructive, 
if we go to the United States and unregulated capitalism that causes, the, for example, rains, there's no drainage system, an appropriate drainage system, there are many floods. So that those are cities um, for that designed for everyone to have a car, for example, and once we don't have any fossil fuels anymore, they are useless. So we should plan cities for them to be efficient, less destructive cities in which we could live, not necessarily um, combined with some requirements. So this is a little bit of what we do. This is our social media, so you can know more about that and about us. We have made many formation videos so that we can communicate this message. Anyone can participate in calculations, but uh, this is basic information. You can participate uh, any of our calculations if you want to with a very basic knowledge, but if not, the information is available, you can make any questions about this. Thank you so much, Renato, for your exposition. We are going to have our second speaker right now, Omer Abdullah, who organizes from Pakistan. Are you there, Omar? Can you hear me? Thank you, uh, comrade. First of all, I would like to, on behalf of Revolutionary Student Front, and Jammu Kashmir National Student Federation, I would like to congratulate International Socialist League for um, conducting a successful youth conference yet again. Um, comrades, moving forwards, either to transcend to socialism or descend into barbarism. These were the words that echoed throughout the last century. But the question of our century is, either we transcend to socialism or face extinction because barbarism is already here. We are living through it and we are killed by it every day. In other words, mindless consumerism by this system for profits, by the 1% elite at the top who owns everything and has all the power to uh, make all the decisions has pushed the bottom 99% to face this existential threat that might very well consume uh, them and the life itself as we know it on this planet. And as I speak to you, Pakistan, 80% of the Pakistan is drowned by historical floods, um, which has displayed 33 million people with their livelihoods completely destroyed, their crops ruined, their lives stock drowned and this is happening in a country which is already at a verge of of of, of default and um, um and 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 is and, and it has a crippling uh, and weak economy under the heels of imf and world bank and other uh, financial institutions so one can only imagine the misery and the helplessness that is upon the workers and the poor masses of this country. And this is just a beginning of the many natural disasters that await us and the crisis that will generate from it. Um, if climate scientists are to be believed, South Asia is going to be um, um, the first and most affected uh, by the climate change. And the irony is that South Asia is um, uh, the least contributor to the to the, the climate change. Uh, although China and India are considered 
as uh, polluters. But if you look into it uh, deeply, uh, you can see that they are producing consumer goods that are being consumed in the core countries. Um, so, and not just South Asia, look at what is happening in Africa, uh, in Ethiopia, Somalia, what has happened in Amazon, in Latin America, in Middle East, um, and, and all, the, all, all the third world uh, collectively combined is going through this. And we are paying for through our blood, sweat, and our lives so that a handful of minority living in the, in the core countries could indulge in luxuries and fetishes. Not long ago, a billionaire built a rocket and went into space uh, for five minutes. And why? Because he wanted to look at Earth from outer space. Uh, it is beyond me what he could have added to our human experience. And needless to say that a rock, when a rocket is built and, and it leaves uh, Earth's atmosphere, uh, the amount of damage it, 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 it does uh, to the environment. And not just him, there are dozens of other buffoons that are ready to um, follow suit, including the one who tied his car to the rocket and sent it to the, uh, to the space. So this blatant disregard and denial, this madness, this stupidity is what is ruling our societies at this hour of crisis. And it, is, it has always been the character of, of, the, uh, of the ruling elite. Um, uh, but in our times today, it has manifested itself in its most vulgar and, uh, and despicable form. Um, moving forward, the crisis that we, um, uh, we are facing, uh, it's not just uh, uh, the mass massive droughts are predicted uh, in a region which is already suffering from, um, uh, from malnutrition and helpless poverty and famines, including the great famine of Bengal. Uh, it has not recovered from it, uh, which was caused by the bloody uh, the policies of bloody imperialists, British imperialists. Um, it just in Pakistan, 60% of the children are already malnutritioned uh, and, uh, and have uh, stunted growth. So one can only imagine that if the, these droughts and famines and, these, and the food shortages triggered by it, um, what havoc that uh, will they um, uh, uh, Cause in, in, in this uh, region. Um, the glaciers in Himalayas are, uh, are melting at a very fast pace. Uh, and because of it, um, um, sea levels are rising and cities like Karachi and, and, and Dhaka are under serious threat. And that, that would trigger um, uh, migrations of millions of people. And one can only imagine what kind of socio political economic crisis it will lead to. Uh, in a in a region that that is uh, completely under the heels of imperialist exploitation, uh, and they are they come to our societies and suck the marrow out of it and sell us death and destruction. Um, comrades, in this struggle, we believe that our it, it is it is a it is a struggle on on multiple fronts. Um, uh, our first and foremost ideological battle is with. Uh, petty reformism. Uh, they are uh, tirelessly push pushing uh, for a reforms only agenda that capitalism can be reformed somehow into an uh, environmental friendly system or technolo uh, technological fixes for, uh, uh, for systematic problems can be the solution for, uh, um, for climate change. Uh, they relentlessly uh, and, and, and they are ready to bang, bend on their backs to uh, mask and hide the fact that the very logic of the system, the essence of capitalism is in contradiction with nature. Um, and, and it is the cause and, and also the hindrance to, to fight uh, uh, climate change. So, so in, 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 uh, in response to uh, look at what, uh, what, what has happened to Bernie Sanders and, and his Green New Deal, um, this, 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 uh, it, is, it is absolutely futile and hopeless uh, to uh, hope uh, any serious climate reforms within a system that is completely controlled by fossil fuel industry, by uh, military industrial complex, by pharmaceutical industrial complex, and all the other oligarchs and monopolists 
who whose uh, very ex existence depend upon uh, destruction of of nature and and and, and if we have to uh, and don't don't misunderstand me i i'm not suggesting that we should not be fighting for whatever reforms that we can achieve within the system but we should be very clear uh, in our agenda and the program that we propose uh, across the countries the countries which are participating in this um, uh, 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 conference and those countries which are not yet uh, part of it we should go to them and we should propose an alternative uh, where we must connect this crisis to the crisis of capitalism and we should propose a socialist system whose logic will not work against the system but in coherence with it and these capitalists sitting at the top uh, think that they can get away with it and they might they they they'll use their rockets and resources to uh, colonize some distant space and they'll leave this planet after destroying it um so let me remind them that they can dream all they want they can um they can indulge in their idiosyncrasies and stupidity for as long as they have time but they will be delusional if they think that we'll go down without fighting uh, we'll fight for our survival we'll fight for our planet we'll fight for our liberation and this conference i believe is just a beginning of it comrades in response to reformism we must uh not only organize um, climate movements uh, independent working class movements around this issue and push the states uh, within every nation to uh, enforce them to make uh, climate reforms but as we know that this is a crisis that affects uh, globally um, the working class around the world right now as i speak not just the the third world countries the developing countries are devastated by uh, by climate change but there are serious droughts in 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 europe and in in, in america and in in the developed country and they are failing miserably in 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 dealing with them so we believe that only a revolutionary internationalist uh, uh, independent working class movement for uh, for uh, around climate change against capitalism for a socialist world can be the answer to our survival um, at the end i would like to leave you with a with a story uh, that we all witnessed here recently uh, in, in in floods of five brothers um, at a time where human capacity and development is at a stage where where we can move mountains we can we can uh pave our ways within seas and outside and around them uh and and what not we and we are we are reaching for stars and 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 galaxies and we are sending telescopes to to to, to deep, deep into the galaxy, galaxies but we saw that five brothers in malakand were trapped in a flood and for five hours they they were they were they were fighting for their life and they could not be rescued and that is the dilemma of our time and that is the question of our civilization that that we despite of all this development despite of all this technological development still there are human beings that cannot be rescued from a flood and they are consumed by water while we all in this country helplessly watch them live on social media so the point of sharing the story is that it is not a fight of 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 some distant future we are not here to protect a future it is a fight that we'll have to fight today and right now if we have to survive otherwise we'll march into extinction like those brothers marched into their death thank you Muchas gracias, Omer, por tu exposición muy interesante. Vamos a. Thank you very much, Omer, for your exposition. We will continue now with the panel. It's Mariano Rosa will speak now. He is the coordinator of the Eco Socialist Network and the leadership of the Argentinian MST. Good morning, Mariano.
I will also share my screen. Let's see. I think you can see it. Okay, so actually I, I wanted to make like a series of comments that have their own continuity with what um, the Pakistani comrade said in his presentation. First of all, um, there has never been so much scientific evidence to sustain in advance a global phenomenon such as climate and social environmental collapse. That is to say, a prognosis of the inevitability, if drastic measures are not taken, of the planetary discontrol of nature. Since approximately the end of the 70s, and with regular reports since 1992 of the IPCC, we do have great evidence to affirm that first, with a radical change in the energy matrix and also that change connect with the form of production and also consumption, all known climate variables will become uncertain and uncontrollable. Without human civilization being prepared for plots, which would be 50 times more drastic than those of Pakistan, and that's a lot to say. And temperature rises without adaptation conditions. Therefore, that means the multiplication of pandemics, such as COVID, as a new feature of the barbarism of this era of capitalism, which features crisis, wars, revolutions, and pandemics. However, there was never, as in this historical times, a dominant social blocks of those who rules of the capitalist. Never has a class interest of a minority been so dangerous and threatening for the enormous majority of people. Never has economic and political power been so concentrated in so few people. And its conduction of this social process has never meant a global danger of such a scope for um, humanity. That means that class consciousness, capitalist class consciousness and its logic, which is maximizing private profit, private gain of expanding economic profitability, that is the foot on the accelerator of a train that is proven to be heading towards collapse and the precipice. Therefore, there is no political or social condition for any operation set or, or measure, such as those that the ideological power plants of capitalism uh, try to install a green reconversion of the system or a green reformism in the framework of an ecological awareness on the part of the 1% that only means to amplify profitability of their business. And this is no abstract um, affirmation or statement. It has concrete um, arguments and undeniable evidence. There is an author that we sometimes quote, his name is Frederick Jameson, who wrote a lot about um, uh, against postmodernism. He talks about uh, common sense. He says that for humanity, it is easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism, even if it's deteriorated and weakened. There is this common sense at a mass scale that still has roots, uh, which is the idea that capitalism is eternal and that it has a great capacity of adaptation. And that false ideology 
In that false ideology or um, this possible adaptation and accepticism of resignation, confuse, confusion are based. The capitalism tries to hold into in order to keep surviving. Then we have denialism, since the, saying that the crisis of civilization through um, the climate crisis does not exist and it is something that Marxism invented. Um, we do have two statements that we should take into account in our political debates um, that also our Pakistani comrade mentioned. One of them is this green reconversion idea through market mechanisms to discourage pollution, greenhouse gas emission, and what includes the lithium fever. For example, here in Argentina, Bolivia, and Chile. That means having some tax uh, incentives and in order to keep on raising profits, they would be uh, reducing their gas emission towards green reconversion. And the other um, false ideology is green Keynesianism and uses this concept of uh, some kind of plan that is financed with public funds so that companies can gradually transform or mutate towards a non-polluting produ production matrix. However, even the two previous um, statements usually use arguments, for example, well, this um, green reconversion, which is some kind of green capitalism, they uh, try to base themselves in historical examples. Resorting to this idea that capitalism has always adapted or reconverted to the conditions of the times and survived for several generations. They use the example of the two industrial revolutions of the 18th and 19th centuries regarding the workers' um, issue or social issues. The conditions of workers' exploitation had no limits. And capitalism itself ended up, ended up granting labor rights like the eight hour workday, uh, legalization of trade unions, even of working class political parties, great uh, socialist uh, European political parties at uh, the end of 19th century and the beginning of the 20th. So why wouldn't it adapt to ecological needs? Why wouldn't capitalism adapt to that? A uh, second example they give is the so-called welfare state on the second post-war period. So they say that if capitalism was able to understand that it was better to give up something in order not to lose everything, facing the influence of the Russian Revolution that at, at that moment had improved the life of millions of workers and peasants, and that they started to get some influence in extended sectors of the working class in the United States and in other countries. Facing that influence, capitalism decided to give away some social improvements in order to avoid revolutions. And it had like 30 years of survival rate until the 70s. That's also something they say in order to argue that there are conditions for capitalism to adapt. But the problem with this historical comparison, which is also mechanical because also uh, all ideology institutions try to uh, perfect their uh, tales and arguments so that they can hold on to uh, consensus and um, common sense. So this um, comparison, when it's transferred to the civilizational, social, environmental crisis, 
is that capitalist, the capitalist system, especially its economic base in the first place, has nothing to do with the expansion of late 19th and early 20th century, the confirmation of imperialism, which allowed to, it to give improvements to working class sectors through colonialism. It was able to, to give some improvements to some working sectors in central countries and also to delay revolution. And it was not through social consciousness, but it was through the workers' struggles that they were able to do so, that they had to do so, especially by the huge impact that the Paris Commune had. But neither does the present stage compare, nor the 30s compare, nor the end of the Second World War, because when in the reconstruction of Europe, a rising capitalist power like the US was able to accumulate such amounts of capital as to allow itself to gain time with the concessions of the welfare state forced by the Russian Revolution and its influence on the working class. So today, the capitalist economy is going through a crisis of more than a decade since 2008, 2009, in which the rate of profitability, of global profitability falls and therefore activates all the brutal mechanism of the systems, of the system in order to compensate or counteract that fall of the global business. That means more labor exploitation, precarization of young labor, uberization of labor, more oppression for economic purposes, racial, gender, and all kinds of oppression. And above all, more mercantilization of nature in a way as a form of capitalist valuation, extractivism, and also as a mechanism to reduce production costs of obtaining cheaper raw materials for global production. Therefore, there are no conditions of green reconversion by giving up profits. That's utopians. We have never known any phase, even during capitalist crisis, in which that has happened and neither to make any concessions. Capitalist has not had this opportunity anywhere, since it does not show vitality in any important country and the fight for hegemony between U the USA and China is uh, in a, de a defensive fight in the framework of an economy whose rate of profit is going backwards. Therefore, it is not a dispute in an expansive phase of the productive forces under capitalism. But there are four important issues, and with this I will finish my presentation, which I would like to mark as a perspective. First, the first one is good news, and the Three following that are a challenge that we and our generation has to face. The good news is that there is an exponential and enormous growth of social, environmental, and planetary awareness in the world, especially in the youth, but that is reaching middle and working sectors even the poorer sectors even, and this is very important for us, specifically to sectors of the working class with their own methods in important conflicts. We do have some experiences here in uh, South America, some in our own country. There has been strikes against enable loss of pollution industry or also growing awareness in the teaching sectors and health workers sectors and we think that is beneficial for our strategy for our upcoming tasks so based on this good news 
of the enormous growth of environmental awareness in the whole world, we do know that we have challenges which are very important. First of all, we have to explain and become specialists in spreading our proposals of ecological socialism, of revolutionary eco ecologism or eco-socialism as the most practical and realistic way out, the most realistic way to ensure social rights, real political democracy of the masses in order to ensure any cost systemic rescue of the planet against this dying capitalism and ecocidal capitalism. We do have a program of eco-socialist transition to reorganize the matrix of production and consumption on a global scale. Second place, um, this pedagogical task of the struggle of ideas and dispute we need to propagate it as a positive pandemic in places of study, work, and especially in the struggles for social environmental causes. They are willing to listen to alternative ways out like ours. It is essential to dispute ideas and for that political readiness and organization and being prepared, and this has to do with our third challenge, which is to fight in a conscious manner a political militants of revolutionary ecology and eco socialism. It being connected with a program of social transformation, a transformation of the economy, of the relations between people, of the political system, of everything, and at a national and international scale not environmentalism separated from a more integral roadmap that places the struggle for power to transform everything, but a militant political action of construction, of the building of a necessary tool for all of this, a militant international organization with national organizations as the tentacles of an octopus for the urgent unpostponable revolution. So the International Socialist League is the contribution we make to that decisive international task because capitalist, capitalism is internationalist, the ecocidal counter-revolution is international too. So our response has to be on that scale now. It is urgent. Just exactly as the Pakistani comrades said, it is up to each party or national organization of the ISL in the international division of revolutionary and eco-socialist labor and tasks to win hundreds and thousands of new activists for this realistic cause to take power away from ecocides. As we like to say, there's no time for indifference. There's no marching for waiting. It is now and it is a struggle to be able to reach this structural change. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mariano. Great exposition. We would like to greet now the fourth speaker of this panel. There's no planet B. Transition in dispute and eco-socialist. So now our comrade from Socialist Alternative from Australia will speak. Jay, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, so yeah, th to, to start with, thank you to the comrades from the International Socialist League for the opportunity to participate in this important forum. Um, and I'd like to say thank you as well to the other panelists for your contributions and also thank you to the translators for, for your work as well. Um, my name's James, I'm a member of Social Alternative in Australia and an editor of Red Flag newspaper. Um, and the, the climate and environmental crisis, as Marian, Mariano said, is truly all-encompassing and global in scope, so there's no solution 
to this crisis within the bounds of one country or even of entire continents. So it's really wonderful to join a panel with speakers from literally four corners of the, the world. Um, in the time I have for my, my remarks, I just want to offer a few thoughts centered on the three themes of this panel. First, the crisis of civilization, the, then the transition in dispute, and then socialist ecology. And in discussing these three themes, I'll try to convey something of the particular experience of socialists in Australia, uh, where we're organizing and fighting in the midst of a growing um, environmental crisis in our small corner of the world. So first, the crisis of civilization. Two and a half years ago in the Australian summer of 2019 and 2020, we got a glimpse of the kinds of extremes of destruction we're going to see with increasing frequency in a warming world. At the height of those fires, with their communities ringed by flames up to 70 metres high, those attempting to evacuate became stuck on highways, uh, clogged uh, with, with evacuees in both directions, and that they didn't know if they'd be able to escape before the flames um, would block their path. Others fled to the beaches and, and sheltered in the sea. And, uh, you know, as the sky turned black, they choked with smoke and showered with burning embers. Unfortunately, that time, only a, a relatively small number were killed, but over 3,000 homes were destroyed. 17 million hectares of forests were turned to ash. An estimated 3 billion animals were killed or harmed, and some endangered species were killed off completely across wide areas. And fires like this are set to become more frequent and more intense in future decades. Already in the most extreme fire weather in Australia, it becomes impossible for fire crews to fight these fires, which generate their own pyrocumulus storm systems, which drive high and erratic winds, uh, you know, blowing the fire and cause lightning strikes, which spark new fires far away from the existing fire front. And just two years later, in February and March this year, instead of fires, we had um, devastating historic floods. Areas along the east coast of Australia, which had burnt in 2019, were now drenched with half a year's rain falling in just a few hours in some areas. One town, was uh, Lismore, was submerged between beneath 14 metres of water, which was a full two metres higher than the past record. And just one month later, the town was submerged again in another so-called one in a hundred year flood. And of course, it's the working class that suffers most in these disasters. We're the ones forced to live in the areas that are most prone to fires, floods and other disasters, simply because that's where the land tends to be cheaper. And in the aftermath of the disasters, we're the ones least able to get back on our feet. The rich, meanwhile, are concentrated in areas less likely to be impacted. And to the extent that they are, they can afford the measures necessary to protect them from the worst of the damage. So what we're seeing is definitely a crisis of civilization, but to a large extent, the capitalist ruling class are immune from this. As the crisis worsens, rather than being driven to act with more urgency, we can expect them merely to increase their efforts to protect themselves while leaving the mass of workers and the poor to suffer. And in a country like Australia, that means more funding for the military and police and more strict border controls and demonization of refugees and migrants, among many other things. And of course, however bad things are for workers in Australia, they're worse elsewhere. The worst floods here have killed tens of people and displaced thousands, where somewhere, as the comrade said in Pakistan, the numbers are in the tens of thousands and the millions. Western powers like Australia bear overwhelming responsibility for the climate and environmental crisis, but we're not the ones that are going to be impacted most severely. This is something that can actually make it difficult in a country like Australia to convey the true depth of the crisis we face. In Australia, it can seem like we could perhaps fix things just with a bit of tinkering here and there, that the system can go on more or less as it is today, just with a bit more investment in renewable energy, some carbon offset programs, some more money for habitat protection and so on. In somewhere like Pakistan, where there's millions of people already being directly impacted by the climate crisis, it's much harder, I imagine, for people to maintain this belief. Now onto the theme of the transition in dispute. I recently published an article with the headline, There is no green transition. We thought it necessary to publish something like this to counter the widespread impression in Australia which is likely the same in other countries, that we're already well on the way to a green and sustainable future. This impression has consciously been fostered by the big polluters 
the fossil fuel industry and the governments that serve them in order to delay any real action that might threaten their profits. They've been loudly promoting the idea of a green transition for decades. Way back in the 1980s, almost 40 years ago, sustainable development was what everyone was talking about. In the 90s, we had the Earth Summit and the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, in 2015, there was the Paris Agreement. At every point, we've been told that everything is okay and that we can just go on with business as usual with just a few minor adjustments. The propagandists of the green transition point to rapid increases in global investment in renewable energy and other green technologies over the past decade. And if you just look at the raw numbers, it might seem like they've got some backing for their argument. So global investment in renewables uh, was estimated to be 366 billion in 2021 which is up from 336 billion in 2019. These figures alone, however, don't tell the whole story. The 366 billion investment in renewables has to be seen in the context of the 1.9 trillion that was spent globally on energy production as a whole, which includes 813 billion on fossil fuels. This points to a problem that can quickly become apparent when you look at the relative position of fossil fuels and renewables in the global energy mix over time. The portion of energy coming from re renewables has increased from 6.6% in 1990 to 8.8% in 2010 to 12% in 2020. But a 5.4% increase over three decades, including only a slight acceleration to 3.2% in a decade to 2020, is hardly the kind of transition that scientists think is necessary. If we continue at the current rate, the portion of renewables in the global energy mix will still be only just over 20% in 2050. And the re reason for this slow progress is clear. While renewable energy production has grown significantly in the past 30 years, so too has the fossil fuel industry. In fact, today, in the midst of this supposed green transition, the industry is still rapidly growing. Reflecting this, in 2021, global carbon emissions rose at a record pace of 6%, despite, at the same time, renewable power generation also growing by a record amount. Concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere aren't just continuing to rise, the rate of increase has actually been accelerating. All this was true before the Russian invasion of Ukraine. In the new situation created by this war, the reasons to be hopeful about this green transition are even fewer. The massive increases in the price of oil, coal and gas caused by the war has triggered a race to expand fossil fuel production by the major powers. In Australia, which is among the world's biggest exporters of coal and gas, the profits flowing to the fossil fuel industry have never been as high. And of course, instead of spending any of this on, on investment in green energy, they're set on developing new uh, massive coal and gas projects. And the recently elected Labor government here stands fully behind this. They came to power in May this year, in part on a wave of public sentiment for more serious climate action, but they've largely just continued the pro-fossil fuel policies of the previous Conservative government. And at the same time, they've managed uh, by legislating a slightly higher but still massively inadequate target for emissions reductions to pull the big environmental NGOs and the Green Party behind them and to almost completely demobilize the climate movement with the exception of a small fringe. So to conclude my remarks on the question of a green transition, we definitely need a green transition. And I don't think it's an exaggeration to say the future of human civilization depends on it, but we're not seeing one yet, uh, whether it's greenhouse gas emissions, the pollution of air, land and water, the rate of destruction of habitats and species extinction, or any other area. And to the extent that we believe the propaganda about this, we're only making it more difficult to win the kind of change that we need. Which brings me to the third and final theme, which is that of socialist ecology. It would be easy for me and uh, also enjoyable to talk about all the ways in which in a socialist system where economic life was democratically and collectively controlled by workers, think things would be very different and we could carry out a genuine green transition in a relatively short time. I think, however, this can be uh, left up to our imaginations. In his thesis on Feuerbach, Marx had the insight that the coincidence of the changing of circumstances and of human activity or self-changing can be conceived and rationally understood only as revolutionary practice. Some years later, he wrote that revolution is necessary 
not only because the ruling class cannot be overthrown in any other way, but also because the class overthrowing it can only in revolution succeed in ridding itself of all the muck of ages and become fitted to found society anew. And I think these two passages are important when it comes to thinking about how we can overcome the environmental degradation of capitalism and the crisis of civilization it's cre created and move towards a socialist ecology. It's clear the changes that we need are immense. Anyone who understands the depth of the environmental crisis will agree with this. But most people too see the solutions as coming from the top down. The answer for many lies in something like the Green New Deal proposed by social democrats in the US and picked up by others around the world. In many cases, these proposals function as little more than greenwashing for the established order. The local council in the area where I live in the Australian city of Melbourne, which is dominated by the Green Party, even said it was implementing a Green New Deal in my area, uh, which consisted primarily of a few new bike paths and planting a relatively small number of trees. But even where the proposal is more ambitious, where it's proposed that many billions will be spent on transforming the energy system, building green infrastructure and so on, it's not the solution that many believe it to be. For a start, there's the problem of how you'd force such a thing through in the context of bourgeois parliamentary politics. The capitalist class in a country like Australia, the immense, immense wealth of which depends very heavily on the fossil fuel economy, isn't going to accept that the industry will be dismantled and the source of their wealth taken away. We need revolution, as Marx said, because the ruling class cannot be overthrown in any other way. But there's another problem. Even if, hypothetically, you could win enough power within the system to attempt to push a very radical version of the Green New Deal through from above, who's to say that people will accept it? Building a genuinely sustainable economy and society requires big changes in the way people live, particularly in a relatively wealthy country like Australia. We need to massively reduce the use of private cars and shift much more to public transport. We need, I think, to shift to more communal ways of living to cut down the use of energy and other resources in the home. There are many people today who think if we're serious about addressing climate change, we need to stop uh, eating meat. How are we to win the critical mass of people to these kind of changes? I think you, know, you can already see that there's a major problem with thinking that you can just do this from the top down with the capitalist state as the main driver of change. Even when very small changes in the direction of sustainability are proposed, there's a strong reaction from the right. The capitalist class and corporate media find it easy to present such things as the imposition of an out of touch elite and a threat to workers' way of life and living standards. This is another reason why to achieve socialist ecology, we need revolutionary practice. Only in a revolution can the working class succeed in ridding itself of all the muck of ages and become fitted to found society anew. We need revolution not only to defeat the capitalist opponents of change, but also to create a situation in which the mass of workers themselves are empowered to decide the, the direction of society. And only in that context can we expect to see the kind of shift in mass consciousness that will make a genuine revolution in sustainability possible. And this is even more apparent when you consider things on an international scale. And I'll conclude my remarks with this. For workers in a country like Australia, the struggle for a socialist ecology is inseparable from the struggle against imperialism. This is both because, as I mentioned earlier, the most severe impacts of the environmental crisis are not going to be felt here first, it will require a sense of solidarity with workers around the world for many in Australia to really understand the urgency of change. And it's also because it will be impossible to win the change we need to address the environmental crisis while our country is joining with the US and other nations in a drive to war with China. So I'll finish there and uh, say thank you again for the opportunity to speak and thanks to the other contributors. Muchas gracias, Shane, por tu exposición. También muy interesante como. Thank you so much. It has been very interesting, such as all other interventions. And um, as you know, since yesterday, uh, you can make any question or comments in the chat. I would like to read some of them for Renato, a Spanish state. They're asking 
what do you mean by uh, public positions at random? And how long have you, your group existed and how do you organize? And what is the proposal of the uh, democratic planet, planned economy? What's the difference between your proposal and the Trotskyist one regarding democratic planning of economy? Uh, for Mariano, uh, there's a question about Chubutahuaso and Atlanticaso and what did those conflicts involve? And um, there's also a question about how class uh, workers' consciousness have developed regarding uh, the environment. Okay, some of them, I'm, I'm replying to some of them in the chat about sitcom. I joined four or five months ago, but I know that it was funded in 2017 approximately. And we organized through a Discord channel in which we plan the, the videos and we also meet um, online. We did meet in person before and we hope to do it again. And there's a question, I think Diego's questions, which are the technologies uh, which can answer to ecological urgency. Uh, for example, the idea of cheap. I think that's a very interesting theory developed by an ecologist, which is called energy instead of energy. That if we want to use a resource, we will need to ask ourselves how much will it cost to use it. For example, fossil fuels, which take millions of years to be generated, then that would be much more expensive than other resources. With ecology emergency, If, if we talk about Marx value theory or dollar or euro value, it has nothing to do with the value of resources. We need to calculate how much does it cost for nature to create that resource. I don't know if that um, answers your questions. I am answering the questions in the chat, however. Okay, Mariana, so there's also a third con uh, question. What would you say to science, scientists and professionals who, works in, who work in the countryside to integrate them to a revolutionary program against extractivism? Yes, I, I, I've been reading the questions. I think that in the case of territorial resistance by opposition to the uh, political center of the country. Opposite to what happens in the capital of the country and in the province of Buenos Aires, but in the rest of the country, there are uh, there's a series of combination of the experience of the last 20 years of environmental struggles in the country and in territories, capitalist and bourgeois states are a little bit weaker in order to block the people's reactions. Because extractivism that is installed in territories 
and other regions of the country with the experience of the 90s with mega mining that promised uh, development and working positions and reactivation of economies. With that experience, especially in the north of our country, in Cuyo and Catamarca, and also in San Juan, mainly, those industries only resulted in the destructuralization of their economies. They were um, destroyed or reduced. They were uh, plundering, short-term plundering industries. Extractivism is a short-term plundering with a minor cost of production, but a wide, uh, high profitability. So with that experience and also with the experience of 2001, boosted by that uh, rebellion, there was a quick reaction in provinces of our country towards any uh, extractivist proposal. So they, there is social unity between uh, provinces, hard to articulate uh, at a national level, but there is a social unity between specialists and also environmental activists, but also by um, productors and middle sectors who see that they, their small uh, entrepreneur companies are at risk in the face of those projects. So there's a social, a strong social um, unity and they uh, avoid or prevent those projects from advancing. So in the last few years, when there's an objective movement, a resistance, we saw it in Chubut, we saw it in the shore, Atlantic shores of the province of Buenos Aires, and it tends to grow nationally. Yesterday in the panel uh, with Chessy, of the uh, Rede Socialista, she talked about the she talked about the wetlands and the burning of wetlands um, related to agribusiness. So those conflicts quickly become rebellions, and that quickly reach the conclusion of fighting for power. They start with an environmental um, issue and then question the political caste. So I think that in the pre-pandemic times, there were uh, climate strikes in the students' movement that were led by some uh, questionable figure like Greta. which uh, she systematically, systematically, capitalism tries to, to co-opt her. She makes quite um, progressive statements and that movement uh, gave an international nature to these um, kind of conflicts. There's no social movement with that um, geographical representation as the environmental one. And uh, women's movement, uh, the sexually diverse movement, because there was a visible humanitarian tragedy. So that results in many sectors participating. Think that the working class issues and every time uh, we say that there's like an interesting intervention an intervention of the working sectors in the environmental activism issue we try to extend it and to deepen it because we, we think it's key for the uh, strategic reorganization of consumption and production 
we do need uh, the working class to be to play a key role in that transformation because it won't be possible if not. That's what we think from the ISL and from the MST and and it uh, it is part of our program. We need a democratic planification of production with direct intervention of workers, a reconversion at global level, even eliminated a series of industries that are damaging no matter who administers them. So when uh, fishers in Chubut voted and, and made a strikes and cut roads with their own methods striking in support of the Chubut peoples against mining, that was an important um, event. There's also a collective of medical workers and health sector workers. Uh, last week, there was um, a meeting in Garrahan, that's a children's hospital, in which health workers and uh, decent organizations and small productors organizations and our environmental organization uh, try to articulate a common program so the teaching sectors are also taking part in it and our, um, their environmental awareness is growing and they want to implement like a pro an environmental education program. So we see uh, the signals and we see these events as something that we have to boost and multiply and take to the working class. This debate of those struggles, the ones regarding the economy and democracy, um, those debates are not separated from those of environmental rights, uh, being able to breathe, to eat without poisoning ourselves. Uh, union bureaucracies and traditional parties are deeply extractivist, and they tend to take apart the economic and democratic rights from the environmental rights. So we think that our task is also to take those debates to uh, the working class sectors. So we also think that it is essential to be able to unify those struggles and to deepen um, our collaborations with uh, scientists and specialists and see how we can spread our analysis and our alternative proposal because obviously capitalism uses science science uh, and they use that science that unworthy science that we call it uh to on their uh, arguments about uh, green capitalism and reformism and other variants. So it's very important for us to also convince scientists and specialists um, to work for an environmental transformation with an anti-capitalist um, orientation, especially young ones, researchers, um, young members of this community which are more sensitive and our organization has its doors open for this sector so that we can fight together okay thank you mariano we can um keep on going with this panel there are some questions for james about what's the unity that exists between the environmental organizations and if you know about the company that wants to um, use green hydrogen here in Argentina, and how's the campaign? This is for the Pakistani comrade. Um, how's the campaign going there? Okay, so James, would you like to speak? 
Uh, yep, I can try and answer those questions. Um, the unity between environmental organisations in Australia. Um, the majority of the environmental organisations um, are very much liberal, small l liberal uh, in their approach and are either closely aligned with the Labour Party, uh, which is currently the party of government um, and is a very pro-fossil fuel party, or they're aligned with the Green Party, which uh, is also uh, has some representation in Parliament. Um, and they tend to be quite conservative in their approach and approach centred on uh, lobbying um, and they don't have an orientation to really challenging any of the fundamental structures of capitalism that are driving the crisis. Uh, and that is very unfortunate um, that this situation exists. Uh, that is the reality we face. There are smaller environmental organizations on the left uh, more that have a more activist orientation. Uh, in recent times, Extinction Rebellion, um, which is uh, originally based in Britain, but has spread to Australia, has been among the, the better people that we've been able to collaborate with as socialists, because even though the overall political orientation is quite different to us, they have a commitment to um, disruptive actions uh, and involving wider layers of people in activism to challenge um, the fossil fuel economy. Uh, and so to the extent there is some unity that exists um, in collaboration on particular projects and particular actions uh, between socialists like us and groups like Extinction Rebellion and others who are engaged in direct action against the system. And that is something that we uh, try to deepen every chance we can, um, in part because we are engaged in a ongoing debate of people of reference uh, with people with different kinds of politics to convince people of the need um, to oppose capitalism uh, and to connect the struggle uh, around climate change to the struggle against capitalism and also to, to have an orientation to uh, bringing workers into that struggle, uh, workers and tra trade unions. Um, so we're trying to do that. Uh, I'm not sure about the company that is um, doing green hydrogen. Um, there is a uh, extremely rich um, uh, iron ore magnet in Australia uh, called, his nickname is Twiggy, Twiggy Forest. It, it could be him. He's investing heavily in green hydrogen. Um, and he, he presents this as the, you know, the way forward that we're going to get to a green capitalist economy, but really the scale of it is, is very small and it, as far as I'm concerned, is um, an effort to greenwash what is his core business, which you know has made him uh, one of the richest people in the country, worth about twenty billion dollars, and that is selling iron ore. So, um, yeah, that's probably that, that, that could be who you're talking about. Ok, Shane, muchas gracias por las respuestas. Eh, ¿Está Omar por ahí? Hola. Omar, cuentas sobre la campaña un poco de solidaridad. Omar, the question is, if you can tell us a bit about the solidarity campaign. Okay, sure. Uh, thank you, Comrade. Uh, 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 I think the question was how the campaign is going on right now. Um, um, as you know, that alongside relief uh, campaign, we have also 
started a protest campaign and I just came back, uh, came from a protest that we organized in Islamabad, the capital of the country, against uh, for climate action and, again, uh, and flood relief, uh, <coughs> which is a continuation of a series of protests first we did in Hyderabad and in Karachi and, and we'll continue it uh, in future as well, uh, along with other activities and we'll try to build uh, momentum around this disaster to uh, not only raise awareness, but to call for action for climate change. Uh, as far as uh, the relief campaign is going, obviously, Comrade Karni also, uh, we are uh, directly hit by the uh, by this, this disasters. Our comrades in Dadu and in KN Shah and in, in, in DG Khan and Fazalpur, the hometown of Comrade Avais Karni, uh, was devastated by the, the floods, directly hit by it. So I will look, use this opportunity to, um, uh, to, uh, um, to call for solidarity across uh, the globe for all those comrades that are listening to us. We need your solidarity. We need in any form that you can uh, provide us. Uh, we are going through difficult times and, uh, and we, we are counting your help and solidarity. Um, and we'll continue uh, this, uh, this, this campaign in form of protests and relief for as much as we can. Um, that's it. Thank you. Bueno, muchas gracias, Omer. Okay, thank you very much, Omar. Evidently, in Pakistan, the ecological disaster and the floods have had a, an impact and have crossed a, this forum and we are organizing to contribute to the campaign from across the world and the campaign that the comrades are carrying out. So we have uh, just a little time left. If any of today's panelists want to add any final words or reflection, let us know and uh, we can go, we can be closing this first panel. To any of the comrades, there's no new questions. So if no one else, I think uh, Mariana wants to say uh, a couple final words. So we'll, we'll hear Mariano's final words and close this first panel. I think uh, in the first place, it's it's been a very positive panel. We've been having a forum that shows to be necessary, as the ISL said in, in its invitation, because of the ecological disaster, because of the current situation, of disasters happening right now, like in Pakistan, also Central America, South America, recently in Australia. Also because I think I want to reflect on one thing. Finally, I think like never before, the combination of a huge and growing sensibility on the ecological issues worldwide present us with a big opportunity as the ISL and different organizations in different countries and regions to advance in relating with excellent activists of the socio-environmental causes who naturally and objectively in their demands, though they may be partial uh, demands over specific issues, end up crashing up, crashing against and clashing with capitalism and with the capitalist parties and organizations and their uh, reformist and insufficient proposed solutions that do not convince the 
youth of today and the activists of today. That's why I think our proposals, our analysis, and using the tools of Marxism, not as a dogma, but as an open method to interpret new phenomenon, which we have before us, the new generation of revolutionary internationalist activists to respond to today's reality that has, that present uh, an endless array of opportunities for building and growing our organizations without sectarianism or opportunism. This is what we can do in the youth with a special attention paid to the working class expressions. Because in the measure that we continue to grow and achieve the objective of leading revolutionary processes in our countries, the task of repairing the ecological disaster that we will inherit from this exhausted system. So this whole process of preparation and building need to incorporate specialists and activists of the social environmental cause is a necessary element for our organizations and the tasks we will have before us in the future. And so we continue on this road with revolutionary passion, multiplying this message and finding more consciousness and sensibilities. Thank you.